happy to be happy to be here. Um, I'm going to start. So we were asked to, to talk a, a little bit about tabletops and why we're doing tabletops, what it means to, to do tabletops. But first, I want to take some a couple of minutes to, to talk about Driscoll's and about what is Driscoll's, what do we do, what do we are, where are we coming from, are we good? With, with sign? Um, so Driscoll's started a long time ago, probably around 100 years ago, as a co-op of strawberry growers up in the Watsonville area. Okay, so everything started back then, where all different independent growers got together and said, hey, I think there's an opportunity to get together and sell our fruit together, so approach to mark the market together. Okay? So everything started back then, and after approaching the market together, they said, okay, let's start saving a couple of cents per, per each box, per, per crate that we sell, and let's start doing some research. So that's how their, the first breeding program started. And then, so they started investing in research in breeding and also in distribution and how to get, how to be more efficient to ship the strawberries from California all the way to the East Coast by train with ice. So it was, I, I, I assume it was a pretty, pretty intense activity. Okay, so everything started back then. And you could imagine that it's like, only providing strawberries in the summer you every year when you start like we are when we are like this time of the year you start ramping up with your production from nothing because you, you are not approaching the customers in the in, during the winter and all of a sudden you have a lot of production so you need to work yourself up to okay build up all the distribution from nothing to a lot of volume so that's pretty tough so that's when Driscoll's folks back I mean back then started realizing okay perhaps it would be easier to sell the summer fruit or we could achieve better prices if we start having a wider production curve instead of, instead of a super peaky one okay let's let's go to somewhere else to grow this fruit so that's how they they started going down to Santa Maria to get a little earlier and a little bit later and then down to Oxnar eventually so to plant to get production in the early spring and then with the summer planting in the late fall and after Oxnard came Florida and Central Mexico. So now Driscoll's has a year-round production supply with some peaks and troughs. The peak is right now, we are in the middle, we are in the next couple of weeks, we are experiencing the peak where Oxnard is producing a lot of fruit. Santa Maria is ramping up pretty quickly and Watsumi and Salinas are ramping up. But the goal is to have a flat production curve or as, as flat as possible production curve. All right. So similar situation happened with uh, with the rest of our commodities. So Driscoll's uh, grows and sells uh, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, and blueberries. And I want to take one minute or a couple of minutes to talk about our mission, which is very important for us and, and it's very critical to, to, to what we do and, and what our scientists do. So our mission is to continuously delight very consumers with, through alignment with our customers and with our berry growers. All right? So our mission is not to sell units, it's not to pump product to the marketplace. Our mission is to delight consumers. And, and that's, uh, I think that's, that's something that it's very clear for all of us that we work with Driscoll's. And that's why we are committed to our breeding programs. And it's not all about yield. If a variety is not more delightful or doesn't have better shelf life than the one that is the standard, it is not promoted. So that is, that is, that is very critical. Um, Driscoll's started in Watsonville, now it's a global company. Uh, sales is around $4 billion, um, probably three of those are in the US market. Then we have production in DEMEA, so Driscoll's, sorry, I, I, I will skip the acronyms. Uh, we have production, in America is the, the biggest portion of the business, then we have Europe uh, that is growing in UK, Belgium, well, Spain, Portugal, Morocco and, and, and a lot of other places. Um, we have small, I mean small kind of startup development in Asia with, with a lot of uh, emphasis in China. 
uh, and then uh, Australia, so uh, Asia, um, Australia, um, Tasmania, and those places. And so because the goal of Driscoll's is to grow where we sell the fruit, okay? So uh, it's the, the, the intention is not to be kind of a, a multinational company shipping from other places, one place to other, which we, which we do until we develop the grow close to the marketplace. Because there are a lot of benefits in growing next to the market, uh, and, and the best one is to, you get better quality, right? Um, all right, so that's a little bit of a background. Um, I started in Driscoll's four years ago in the strategic planning team, and uh, eight months ago I joined, I moved into operations. I used to be like pretty high level, five year view, and now I'm operations in the day to day, uh, working with our growers. Um, so I manage the, the, Oxnard, the Oxnard district, which is worth about $600 million, um, and we have a lot of strawberries, like 4,000 acres of strawberries, 3,000 acres of raspberries, 600 blues, 600 blacks. Um, big projections of increases in raspberries, switching technologies to substrate, um, interesting interesting growth in, in the summer planting deal for, for strawberries. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen with the spring because, as you might have heard, there's a lot of production uh, this time of the year and through the summer, so the prices are pretty are, are pretty challenged um, and blackberries growing big time and blueberries not that much so that's kind of an overview of what's going on pretty close here uh, in Oxnard okay so now jumping into into the tabletops um, well I would encourage everyone to make questions uh, as, as, as you have them uh, don't I mean it's okay to interrupt let's 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 try to do it as, as interact as, as we can I think that's that's better any questions so far no we good all right so why tabletops um, first does it, everybody know what is tabletops yeah so basically it's where Growing strawberries uh, instead of we're taking the taking the plants out from the soil onto a substrate bag or substrate pot in, 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 in on top of a table or of a metal gutter which we call a table. So basically, our primary goal is to raise the raise the plants from the soil. We want to create a better environment for the harvesters to harvest. All right. Um, Harvesters are our number one priority in, 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 a, in the berry industry. It's so labor intensive, it's, it's our biggest, when we look at our P&L, our profit and loss to the, for, the, for the, when we analyze the business, harvesting is the biggest single line item by, by far. It's like rent is $4,000 an acre, harvesting is 20,000 in, in Oxnard and it's like 40,000 up in Watsonville because it's a longer season, it's a bigger production. So har harvesters, uh, harvesting is our biggest cost and as you might have heard, it's like there, we're, having, we're having a lot of uh, problems with, with the labor force where we don't have enough, enough people to support our growth plants and uh, minimum wage and overtime loss in California, are, I mean so costs are only going Going higher, and we have less and less people because the labor force is aging out. So that's some of the background. The other part of the background is like uh, stro harvesting strawberries is the toughest, is one of the toughest jobs in the ag industry, and that's why strawberry harvesters get get paid more than raspberry harvesters or blackberry or blueberry or other vegetable harvesters, and that's only because they are bend bending down all day long. It's only because of that. So when you raise the beds, you're changing the game. You're changing the changing the job. So kind of the theory uh, is that by raising the bed, we are going to have people that in the soil they are not willing to go and work in the soil. They will they will be okay working in the tabletops. And that supply and demand of jobs, of, I mean, people wanting to work is going to be greater than the people wanting to go into soil. So that is going to, to, to work out in, in the economics, right? Because 
because it's, it's given it's a different work, it might might be might need a different pay, and most likely, I mean, because of the supply and demand, should be a lower harvest cost. Okay. Okay. There are other reasons by what we want. This is the number one reason. We want to be the preferred employee in the region. Okay. Um, so harvesting strawberries in soil is one of the most difficult jobs in ag. We have an aging labor force. The, our, our labor force each year, the average age of, our, of, of, the, of the harvesters, it's getting up and up because there are not, not as, ma as many new harvesters coming into place. Gonzalo? Yes. Would you move closer to the screen? Yes. So the video camera will capture both? Yeah, absolutely. There you go. Um, we have a shrinking labor pool because the, the labor pool is not replenishing as, as it was. Um, most of the harvesters are, are coming from Mexico and Mexico's economy is doing, is doing good, is doing better. People are getting, are getting, are studying more, are willing to stay in Mexico more. So, which is good, it's awesome. Um, and we don't have, but on the other hand, we don't have enough people to harvest our fruit. So. There is more competition for the people, which is good. So we have we have to step up our game and and, and create a better environment to to draw more people, to, to be more attractive, to pay more, or make the job better, make the job easier. Um, another component is that something that happened in UK that James is going to touch in is like soil fumigants are being regulated. So we are done with cl with chloropic uh, sorry with, with methobromide. Um, we have chloropicrine, but, but sometime at some point uh, it's going to be regulated. So we better get started. All right. So that's the why. Um, there are, there are some pros and some cons about about uh, tabletops. Pros. Easier working environment than soil harvesting, potentially attracting workers from various crops or other industries, no fumigation, no ground prep, so you're saving money, you're, you're saving a lot of money uh, in, in, in establishing your field. So the tabletop systems, like you build your ranch once and for good, where in the, in, in the current system, you need to do your ground prep every year, disc your field, bed it up, put your plastics, uh, do all the stuff. I mean, pay for the fumigation that is like four, four or five thousand dollars an acre, which is that's that's a lot of money. Um, so in in tabletops, you only pay for when you build infrastructure, which is pretty expensive. But you save you you pay you pay more for this infrastructure, but you save in other in other areas. And kind of the goal is to save also at the end. Kind of when kind of the theory is that when when this technology is is adopted commercially, uh, it will mean that you get a different different pay structure that will 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 result in a lower harvest cost. So that will pay for the um, for the extra cost. Okay. Some cons that we are having a bunch of high initial capital required. It, it costs between fifty thousand to eighty thousand dollars an acre for, of infrastructure. So we're talking about uh, automatic irrigation systems, uh, gutters. So the metal gutters, the extru ex extrusion of those gutters installation of, of the tunnels, underground irrigation, above the ground irrigation, substrate bags, emitters, um, a lot of things. Yes? Is all of this in a greenhouse? No, these are, these are just regular tunnels. These are tunnels. No, it's uh, tunnel. everything is tunnel. So far, everything is tunnel. James is going to talk about um, tunnels. <laughs> yeah. I think we're. I mean, all, all most of our uh, strawberries are grown open on open air. Um, so I guess at some point it will be nice to to do some trials with open air. But James is not a big fan of that. Um, so yeah, we, it's not going to work. Yeah, basically James is <laughs> says it's gonna, not going to work. <laughs> so we're doing with tunnels. Um, but but yeah, I mean, we started. When was our first tabletop project? 2015. I think so, yep. Santa Rosa. So we started four years ago, and we've learned a lot. 
the hard way. Uh, we learned a lot of things that we don't have to do. We're trying to replicate things that we're doing in soil, in subcrease. So it's a, it's a completely different mindset. It's a completely different skill set that the grower has to have. Uh, f feed recipes, automated uh, irrigation systems. Uh, you need to stop thinking about in a per acre basis and I start talking about per linear basis because you, your biggest cost is, is linear. Your biggest cost is the infrastructure, is that metal gutter, is that, is that pod, the, the, the subspray coil. So you need, to, you need to optimize your yield per linear meter and forget about the, the, the area cost or the overhead per acre. So uh, it, has been, it has been interesting. We can touch on that. Um, yeah. So are you also then expecting to see like, expanded production windows for each region if you're putting it all under hoops? Uh, not really, uh, not really, not really. What we've seen is that we can get better quality in, in, in the tails of the season in Oxner, for example, that's, we, we've experienced that. Um, and we could, I mean, th this could serve for sure, this could serve for the earliness of the crop because it's protected from the rain. Um, like, and in a year like this, yeah, that, I mean, the tabletop projects, they got some benefits on, on the rain protection, but it's not the primary goal. The primary goal of the hoops is to cre create, and, I mean, and James could explain it way better than I, it's, it's, to, it's a better environment from, for the plant to thrive uh, in terms of uh, humidity, heat control, and so forth. Um, yeah? Uh, what about pollination? Uh, any issues with lack of wind in there? Or? Yeah, well, I think, I don't think so. I think James, you can touch on that. But I think, I mean, the growers are working on the ventilation uh, pretty much, and they are pretty high tunnels. Um, and the growers are experienced with working with tunnels from the raspberries. All our raspberries and blackberries and most of the blueberries are with tunnels. So they work with the, uh, we work a lot with the pollination. Make sense, James? Yeah, that's a good point, yeah? Uh, okay, so I'll go on a little bit more to, to the cons. Uh, this system, we find out that it's pretty dependent on genetics and plant types that are completely different than what we do in soil. And we have this, imagine this kind of transatlantic that it's our breeding program and our nursery that have been doing things in the same way forever, uh, breeding genetics in soil and multiplying cloning plants in the nurseries, uh, bare root plants. Okay, so this is complete, we need completely different things. We need to start breeding in tabletops because plants behave differently in tabletops. So we need, to, we need a compact plant that exposes the fruit a lot with long trusses, bigger fruit, uh, and most likely not a bare root. We need a, or a mister tip or a tray plant, most likely more a, more a mister tip. Which is, which, is a, which, is a, which is a daughter that was tipped into a cell and, it's, and it comes already rooted. So you, plant, you, plant a, you are planting a plug that is already rooted. So it takes off quicker than, uh, quicker than the bare root. And, and that's what we need for, for tabletops. But yeah, we could do the mindset change for per acre to linear meter, I already talked about that. So far, yields haven't been there consistently because uh, we are still learning and still a lot of things to things to learn. Um, and the other thing is that we are competing with the most efficient soil operation probably from the world. Uh, we hear a lot of stories that oh, in Australia they switched in two years, 100% was substrate. Okay, well, in Australia the, the soils were not that good. So as soon as they switched to substrate, they got a bumping a 40% or whatever, an increasing yield that paid for everything. And the prices of the fruit is, is outrageous. So you, any higher yield is gonna pay for every, anything. That's not the case here. Here, everything is so efficient. Growers do a great job in growing. The varieties are optimized to our environment and the harvesters are flying. So it's pretty hard. I mean, we're competing to a really good competitor. Um, so as you can see, it has been, it has been tough. 
and the, the water you need a, a really good water quality for tabletops which uh, as, as we know California is most of the time in a drought situation we see salt intrusion so a lot of our wells um, are not suitable for for tabletop production that said we are both bullish and the company is still bullish in, in, in tabletops. We think that it's, it is going to be part of the future. We are not saying it's going to be 100% in all the 34,000 acres that the strawberry, we, have, we have strawberries in California are going to be tabletops. No, that's not what we're saying. But we think that it is going to be part of the future, mostly because of the labor component and the regulations uh, from, from, uh, from fumigation. Um, and, and, and again, it's, it's all about the labor. It's a labor game. We, we had a lot of issues in the past with not having enough labor to harvest our crop. And that's the worst thing that can happen. So we, are, we, we had in the last couple of years, we had kind of tempered our growth to say, okay, how much can we harvest in the peak? Um, because the market was able to take it. Well, right now we're in a different situation where the industry is oversupplied and the market is not able to, to take so much fruit. That, that's a different conversation. But the labor issue, it is, it is, a, it is a real issue. It is a, it is a labor quantity. It, that's a real issue. So we need to compete. And in order to compete, we need to be the preferred uh, employer. I mean, right now, if you are a soil grower and you don't have a good crop, Harvesters will, will leave you and they go to the neighbor. So you need a good job. Well, this is the same. It's like we are getting a better environment for our growers. So that's that's kind of the, the, the message. Make sense? Um, current situation in Oxnard. I I talked a little bit about this, and James is going to talk. So you guys can can get this into the, in, in the in the in the slides when you when you get them. Um, yeah. Do you want to go, James? Sure. Questions? Could you market the product differently coming out of the tabletop and out of the soil? Like a different market? That's a good question. Uh, no, no, so far, that's not the strategy. Um, we only have, I mean, we only have so far, we have 23, we have like, let's say 35 acres of tabletops in Oxnard. We have 10 acres of tabletops in Santa Maria and 20 acres in Watsonville. So let's say let's call it let's call it 100 acres in California versus 5,000 acres in the north, 1,300 in Santa Maria, and 4,000 in Oxnard. So it's, so far it's, it's minimal. Um, and I so I mean that's not the strategy. Who knows if in the future it's that way? We know that one of our competitors is is marketing differently um, but that's not our strategy this is it's not a go-to-market strategy it's a labor retention strategy it's a good question All right James oh maybe James is gonna answer this but uh, how far you said that the yields aren't there yet so we're not achieving the yields that we get in the field in the um, tabletop that would be acceptable. Uh, well, we didn't achieve it, we're not, we haven't achieved it consistently. Last year was the first time that we did it in a per linear meter base or in a per plant basis, right? Yeah. We achieved the targets. I think we're a year up. In Watsonville, it's a bit easier. We'll hit the targets there this year. Oxnard, we're probably two years away from hitting a sensible target. So in Watsonville, we're matching so the best soil yields. Oxnard, we're probably half the sort of best soil yields. A bit more work to do. Yes, but we need to, we need to analyze it. Forget about per acre. It has to be yeah. per linear meter. It's not even per plant because most of the costs are per linear meter. The biggest cost is the depreciation of the infrastructure, specifically the, the, the depreciation of the that, that, that metal that is supposed that is depreciation over 10 years, plus the bag of oil or the, 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 the pot. So are you converting your linear, your linear feet in the field so that you can make the appropriate comparison and forget about acres? I mean, that's probably the way the growers would do it anyway, right? Linear feet of bed? Yeah, or I mean, 
think we, we, we had to, to, to be able to convert. We, we need to go from per acre to per plant, to per plant in the tables, okay. to per meter or per, per linear feet, whatever. And we talk meters because yeah, this because it's more sensible. Is this an hour? Because right. it's about time. That's right. Which basically all the learnings from substrate are coming from Europe or some other country. So we cannot, we cannot talk. So we can have this principles made at the creation that we are measuring. Better for us to be because we're both coming from a metric country. That Absolutely. That's the language of science, so yep. this room should, uh, nobody should be a stranger to that. Okay. On tabletop, you get access to marginal land of lower rent. You can do things under a hoop that you can't do on yeah. $4,000 rent grant, right? You can produce an area that's. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point, and we were all excited, really excited about that, about this topic, because we, did, we thought that we were able to shape a thousand dollars per acre pretty quickly. But what we found out is that usually <coughs> the best ground is because it has the best water. So we need water. <coughs> we cannot do it in hills, like doing hills, the, the installation cost. Hill is crazy, it's like you cannot spray well, like they need to be flat and they need to be water. And usually a bad ground is a salty ground and it's salty because you have been irrigating with salty water. So Okay. Um so how many here are going to work in the strawberry industry or the berry industry? One, two. Maybe. I, the reason I wanted to do this seminar is because I'm responsible for hiring um, technical and agronomy staff, and it's impossible to find sufficient people. We advertise for six months or a year for people to come and work in our R&D department and in our, our technical support department. So. And I think there's a rewarding career in berries. Um, I've traveled all over the world. It sounds crazy, but it's true. So at least consider it. And hopefully this may show some interest. Can I, can I share something more in that regard? Um, because I'm working in Syngenta, and so I come kind of from a different perspective. And Driscoll's is invest a, like a lot of money. I mean, Driscoll's invest hundred million dollars per year in R&D, fancy labs, um, fancy agronomists. Uh, so Very small proportion of that hundred is, is this, me. And this comes to the value of the crop, which is crazy compared to commodities. Like, I mean, we, we, t we tend to say we are not in the commodity business. We, are, we, we sell a product with a brand that has a price premium. And because of that, we are able to uh, invest in R&D, and it makes sense to invest in R&D and uh, in developing the technologies. Because the, the, the revenue, the, just, this is just an example, the revenue per acre of a strawberry field is $100,000 per year. And the revenue per acre of a soybean crop is what, in the Midwest or something? Okay. Or 600, 400. So that's the difference, okay? That's, that's, that's the difference. And that's the difference of impact that you as scientists or people that are focusing on plants are going to be able to make. Um, it's, it's massive. You, you, make, you create something that can achieve a 20% higher yield, so boom, it's, you're changing the game. Um, Okay, so we've got three minutes to go. <laughs> so we'll just click on through this quickly. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it's okay. So I moved over from the UK essentially to help with the substrate, and the idea was that the UK is doing this anyway, so it'll be easy. Um, and it turns out it's different in California. So what I'm trying to do here is just very quickly cover what tabletops is and some of the challenges and so on. I am going to skip a few slides. You can read them. Um, so one of the problems with strawberries is that every single geographic region we have has different varieties. So we grow different varieties in the UK, different varieties in Watsonville, Santa Maria, Oxnard, um, Australia, Morocco. They're all different varieties, so we can't copy and paste. And so these first few slides are just showing you this is a Junebera crop in the UK. It has its own particular season. This is an Everbearer crop in the UK. It has its own particular season. And then we get to California. So this is a photo from our website. This is our, the grandparents of our current um, owners growing strawberries in 1904. And then this is our current field outside the R&D office. And so we've had essentially 115 years growing in the open soil in beds. We've now got to change this whole system and move it into tabletops. California in the north, we plant in November, and then we have this huge long cropping profile. In the south, we have essentially two productions, one to deal with the autumn, so we plant in July, and then we harvest in the autumn, or the fall, I should say. Um, and then we have a second planting, which is in September, and crops in the spring. So essentially, we have three production systems for California. We've got to design tabletops for each of these systems, and there they are. And you need those three systems to put the year together. So right now, as Gonzalo says, we're around about here, and we've got Watsonville. I've come to Santa Maria, and I haven't put Santa Maria on here, I realize. Anyhow, Santa Maria is a com can do both Watsonville and Oxnard. And so that's my excuse for not putting it on there. So we've got to design different systems for different regions, different varieties, and so on. Um, I'm going to skip over this because Gonzalo covered this. This is the, the site I used to be responsible for. Soil growth, growing seems easy, but it, it does have its problems. So this was the day before we were supposed to plant this field. And as a result, we didn't. But tabletop solves some problems. It's not all bad news. Um, substrate production, we're doing on all crops. Blueberries, we've been able to just roll out, and there's no problems, and we're just doing this. Um, raspberries and blackberries are slightly easier. Strawberries essentially are a complete nightmare. Um, and it's because they're so much more sensitive to everything else. We've got a small coir volume per plant, so it's much more sensitive. We replant every year, so you've got replant problems, nursery senders, phytoptera plants, and lots of pests and diseases, which I'll talk about a couple, and are sensitive to salt. Whereas these, we can do pretty easily, I think. Tabletop system is essentially lifting the bag off. This is the system we started with in the UK about 20 years ago, and it was just four wires running down the field, and then you balance the bag on this. But of course, what happens is, in the wind, those, those wires bend, and the whole field ends up on the ground. So gradually, over time, we've moved into more and more complex systems, and this is where we're now at. So this is our Watson Mill site, but you'll see the same in Oxnard, and the same down the road in Santa Maria. It's a metal post with a gutter that's extruded. This is a photo from a glass house in the UK. So it's a metal gutter. You stick the bags or the pots on that, and that's where the plants grow. And as Gonzalo says, the height of them means people don't have to bend down and pick them. Um, so this, this photo was taken yesterday. We're picking, and it, the plants are green, and the fruit's red, so it's going OK. One of the challenges we have is that all of the machinery that we have is designed for the soil. And we've suddenly got to come up with new methods. So this is the UK system. We drive, we have a wide row in the middle of a tunnel and we just drive a tractor through. 
This is our spray that we have. We've got, how many of them have we got? Four sprayers or something. These are 120 grand sprayers, and this is our site in um, Watsonville being sprayed with it. So the whole system, doing tabletops suddenly changes everything. Um, we now grow in Koya, and if you look online, you'll see some fantastic videos of how manual this process is. This chap's putting coconut husks into a machine that grinds it, and then it spews it out the other end. This chap's grading it by driving around on a motorbike. This is how it's done. We have to take that Koya, have a standard product, and try and grow strawberries in it, and it's really difficult. This is essentially what we end up with at the end of the process. We either have a bag, or we have a trough, we put cocoa fiber in it, and we select a mix between each of these different types. So koya pith is very fine dust, and then the chips at the other end are chunks that allow water to percolate. So this is what we're growing in. And you'll see this in other industries, tomatoes and so on. It's 100% koya. It's 100% coir. Yep, yep. So these, this, they grind it up. This, they just chop it up. And this, they shred and then collect the fibers. And then depending on how much of each of these components you put in, you get different water holding capacity, different drainage capacity, and, and so on. So we have different mixes for blueberries, raspberries and blackberries, and strawberries that we, we specify. Um, plant types. Um, so this is what we've been doing for a hundred years. We grow it in the soil, we collect the runners, and we plant the bare root. This is what we're now doing. We're growing. The nursery now becomes a glass house. We collect all the all the small daughter plants, put them in trays, and then send them to growers like that. And the reason we're doing that is because the whole system is expensive, so you may as well spend a bit more on the plant. But again, it's about added complexity. This is the irrigation system. One of the biggest differences, as Gonzalo said, was you, in the soil, back home I used to irrigate the soil strawberries once a week. And essentially the decision was, one of three mixes, and whether you do it an hour or two hours of irrigation. Here, you're making up a very specific recipe with 10 or 12 different fertilizers that you dissolve in these tanks. You then spend around 70 grand on an irrigation rig to pump it out and to dilute it. You've got to have different main lines in the field because each variety needs its own particular mix. And then it goes out to the plant through these drippers. So that whole lot adds about half a million to a site. Then you start playing Nintendo, and this is our rig. So this one, this page here, which you'll probably see on the PowerPoint easier, but this is what we program into the computer to tell the rig what to irrigate. So this is our timings, so this is our strategy. So here we're controlling how long we irrigate for and what time of the day. And we'll be irrigating at two minute shots or four minute shots every 20 minutes or every half an hour. And then this is our recipe page, which tells us what fertilizer, what tells the rig what fertilizer to use, what concentration and what pH to use. And so it's this part that I get involved with, essentially. And then you've got to monitor it. This is, this is actually a photo of a site in Santa Maria. This is a previous system which weighs the bag and controls the whole irrigation. So it means the grower can sit at home and not worry, just let the computer run itself. But we still manu manually check it every single day. How much have we irrigated? how much is drained through the bag, what concentration it is, and so it, it adds an extra level of complexity. So this is, the, this is the whole core of it, a bucket in a field which you measure every day. And then based on those results, you change it from two minutes to two and a half minutes, or however it goes. 
and then we've got to deal with California water. When I first came here and I started talking to growers, do you know what EC is? Electrical conductivity. So growers would say, oh, my water's 1.3. And I would say, oh, right, what about the water, though? And because back home, my, my, the highest EC water I ever had was 0.7. And here, this is a ranch pretty close to here. And this is an EC of 1.3. And it's got 100 ppm of, of sodium, which is a bit of a nightmare. Oh, sodium, 105 ppm. So, because the whole system is um, more sensitive, every single ranch will do this and then have their own separate recipe, which we have to calculate. And that gets redone every month. Pests. Um, Birds is actually our main predator, our main um, pest, right? So we net a whole site. This is Watsonville, and still we get eggs laid in our straw strawberries. I took that out and put it in the soil strawberries outside. I yeah, thought he could, <laughs> he, he could do, deal with that problem. And then we have mites. This is Lewis mite, which is a big problem for us. And then um, spider mites. And we are trying to control those without pesticides uh, by using predators. And then the only pesticide pest we're currently spraying for is ligus, or we have to spray. Everything else we can control with predators. Are you getting ligus in your tunnels? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it happens earlier than in the soil. They seem to like that environment. Um, and then diseases, mildew is the number one disease. It's the problem, we talked about tunnels. The problem with the strawberry bag is it's up in the air and it's a small volume, so it's colder compared with a big volume of soil which gets all the sun. So we have to use tunnels. Um, we are trying no tunnels, but currently the no tunnel plots have produced not a single berry yet, whereas the other ones are on about 200 crates an acre. So I, will, I wasn't joking when I said don't do it. It, we shouldn't be doing it, but we are, or at least on a small scale to test it. The problem with putting a tunnel out, you suddenly create the perfect environment for mildew, high humidities, warm temperatures, and our varieties are bred outside, in the soil, in the open air, under low mildew pressure. We move them inside and they all get mildew. So this was taken um, yesterday from one of our, from our tabletop site in Watsonville and you can see we're already dealing with a problem. So if we could sort out the mildew, it would be a real help. And so, will it work in California? My gut feeling is it will. I think Watsonville, we're nearly there. Oxnard, we're a couple of years away. And that was me in 12 minutes. Thank you. Any questions? Um, so there's two reasons. The, the first is the temperature. So our yields essentially come from having a long season. And so in Watsonville, we're picking from April all the way through to October. And then Oxnard, their yields work because they're harvesting during the winter. So it's all about temperature. In the soil, during the day, the soil heats up, and because you've got a big volume of soil, and you're not irrigating it constantly with cold water throughout the day, the temperature stays warmer. And so we see at least four weeks difference between a soil and an untunneled tabletop crop next to each other. Soil earlier. The soil is four weeks earlier. So the reality is, to get that long season, we have to tunnel to keep them warm. The other reason is because the fruit quality is better with the tunnels. It doesn't get bashed around by the wind. You don't get that. You probably all had strawberries where you get those prominent seeds and it's not very pleasant. You get that in tabletops without the tunnels. And then the final reason is the plant is just a lot less stressed because it's high humidity better temperatures, and so you get better fruit size and better quality. So 
I've come from the UK where you can't grow strawberries at all without tunnels, and I've come over here and trying to evangelize the USA into using tunnels. I'm the finance, the finance guy trying to say. Yeah, yeah, I'm God's Arlo's worst nightmare as far as this goes. Did you get any um, you get coffee with nutrient rich water in the substrate? Did you get any algae problems in your system? Mm. Yeah, so we do. Um, so the, the, the water drains through the bag into the gutter. In that gutter, you get algae growth. You don't get it in the main drip line running from the rig through the field to the dripper because it doesn't stay in there long enough. Now, we had a raspberry field last year where we had, um, so that the spaghetti that goes from the pipe and into the bag has to be black or it can be white but black on the inside to stop light. We had a defective batch of emitters come from the manufacturer and blocked around 20% of our emitters because the light kept on hitting that water. So it can be a problem, but it shouldn't be. So the bag kind of keeps it from not being a problem. Yeah, yeah. And the, const the fact that you're constantly changing that water the whole time, you're not just pumping it out and leaving it there for a couple of days. It's this constant refreshing of the water. So it's one of the few problems we don't have yet. Yet. Yeah. Uh, is it because you were using water or white Um Yeah, so so phytophthora I put in brackets because it really should not be an issue. We're planting a new plant into a sterilized bag, but we do get phytophthora. And the reason I put up there is once you get phytophthora in a tabletop, because all the bags are essentially lined up it just travels down. So we have this saying, if in doubt, blame the nursery. If there's a problem, you can blame the nursery. But actually, in this specific example, for tabletops, the only place that phytopla can come from is the nursery. And so that's why we're using tray plants and substrate plants to try and remove that possibility. So it shouldn't be a problem, but when it is, it's a big problem. mentioned that you really don't want transplants from the nursery, bare root plants, for that reason, and now you have to convert to a plug system. Yep. Also, another sterile system where yep. you can keep all the pathogens out. So do you see that also, like the nurseries, the bare ground, bare soil, nurseries going away, and that being replaced by greenhouses that are growing plugs? Yeah, so perhaps the best example I can give is in the UK. So we produce about 30 million strawberry plants for the UK. What, 30? 30 million. And something like two thirds of those are plug plants. And the only bare roots we now use are for one specific window where we have to do it in the soil. So it will happen, but like Gonzalo says, we've got 34,000 acres in California. It's not going to happen. It's a lot of plug plants. It's a lot of plug plants, yeah. And it's a whole new technique that the nursery has to learn. Yeah. We're new learning varieties. new varieties, yeah. It's now the chill problem. Yep. The chilling has all changed, right? It's yep. all problem. You're not trying to get chilling hours. You're, it's all different. So your yeah. genotypes have to be different. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But you need to find the right place to condition the plants, you know, this is the right multiplication rates, to create infrastructure for those two mothers. So the nursery is expensive as well, if you are not efficient. Well, I just looked, uh, if I remember, there was an experiment that Driscoll's did out in Santa Maria with a, with a mechanical transplanter. Mm -hmm. And all they were all plugs. Well, um, you know, we get the bare root plants in a box about this big. There's a thousand of them in there. Yeah. For a thousand plug plants, it was two pallets, ten feet high. So. 
Yeah. You know, that's a big logistics or chain. You know, you come out with a semi now yeah. full of plug plants versus, you know, one pallet for yeah, I think that the, the the opportunity for plug plants is not only the phytophthora and disease risk, because you're starting off with a bigger plant, particularly in Oxnard, where you have these short cropping cycles, which is similar to the UK, the yield increase is about, well, between 30 and 50 percent compared with a bare root plant in this type of system. So the, there is an opportunity to be had there. It's not all problems. It is worth going after. Um, why is it that you got to use water, is it water at your substrate? Yeah. Have you looked at anything else? Yeah, so we started off in the UK uh, using Irish peat, and then the, manu then the supermarkets said they didn't, the supermarkets have much more power in the UK than they do over here, and they specified they would not take berries from plants grown in peat because of the environmental lobby. We then tried coir, and coir is actually much better, and much easier, because it holds on to the water less than peat does. The problem with peat is it's very fine and it just soaks up that water, and particularly in California where we want to push the water through the bag so we don't build up those horrible salt levels. Coir is actually a better product. Um, we are looking at other things, um, wood fiber, redwood fiber from Northern California, but so far there's uh, um, almond husks from the Central Valley, incorporating some of that. But so far, there's nothing that um, is as reliable as co cocoa, essentially. Is there enough core to, if you converted 35,000 acres to tabletops? Well, <laughs> the, I don't know, the tomato industry is all the right? <laughs> so it's, I, I, I asked a botanical that ex exact question. They said, oh, no, no, you're fine. We're only using 10%. We, we were using Sri Lanka right now. But we, we've still got India. There will be plenty. There's loads around there. And then they said, oh, I'm sorry, there's a shortage. Your price is going up. Yeah. So I think, well, hold on. So the truth is we don't know. But wait. Because they'd like the, the, the price to go up. <laughs> That's right. So there we go. You have no barriers. I don't know. We'll see. It's a good. It's a good point, though. Yeah. No, we use the same system for all our substrate crops. Blueberries are a bit less sensitive, so we can use a dositron-based system there. But for raspberries, blackberries, and strawberries, it's the same sort of system. And that one I showed you was a Priva, which is the most expensive. There are other versions, Senmatic and Netafilm, which are about 20 grand. But it's the same principle. It's a computer running the irrigation system. And so it has like sensors detecting the moisture content? Yeah, so th there's sort of two levels to it. One, you just program it yourself and you manually tell it how, when to irrigate and how, how much. So every half hour for two minutes or... And then you go to the other extreme, like that Priva way scale, and that is controlling the irrigation. So you tell it what your bag want, has to weigh. The way scale weighs it. As soon as it gets below that target, it tells the rig to send. And then it also has an EC sensor to tell the rig what EC it's at to change. And so you have to set the parameters for EC and weight. Um, and then the rig runs itself, essentially. It's a risky thing because you're only using two bags to run the whole field. But that's the principle. That sounds pretty interesting, um, especially when you think about the weight, that the weight's going to change during the day mm. based on the size of the fruit. And harvesting, yeah. And so Priva has, the, in the background, Priva has written the program. So if it senses a sudden change, like when you're harvesting, it ignores that. And it makes the assumption that it's, it's not going to grow enough over one day 
for that growth to affect the weight of the water sufficiently to change the irrigation. And every night it resets its, its weight value and starts again at 7 in the morning or whatever. So it's a, it's a very, it's a pretty nice system when it works. I think we're done. Questions? All right, let's Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Welcome to Stipper Out the Avenue.